Good morning, everyone, esteemed industry leaders, distinguished guests, respected faculty members, and my dear friends. On behalf of the SPGIMR family, I, Omkar Devedi. I, Anshul Opadhyay. Welcome you all to Samavesh 2022. Samavesh is SPJIMR's annual industry academia conclave. Organized by the students of postgraduate program in management, this event is a platform for eminent thought leaders from industry and academia to discuss and debate contemporary issues in the field of operations and supply chain, finance, information management, business analytics, and marketing. Before we begin, we request you all to put your phones on the silent mode. Also, please continue to promote the event using hash Samavesh2022 on social media through your post and tweets. SPJ and Institutes of Management on Research, an integral part of Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan, was established in 1981. The Institute's mission has been to influence practice and promote value-based growth. A constant focus on the development of not just skills and knowledge, but also attitude and spirituality is critical to the learner-centric approach at SPJIMR. The curriculum instills competition-based efficiency and collaboration-based ethos in all the participants. PGPM is a one-year full-time residential management program aimed at accelerating the careers of participants with over five years of experience. The USP of PGPM is enhancing the functional and managerial capabilities of the participants with substantial corporate experience. It has a rigorous multi-stage admission process to select candidates with skills, experience, and temperament to take up the leadership roles. The program has state-of-the-art curriculum, instructors with rich experience in industry and academia, and a combination of classroom and experience-based learning. These features develop well-rounded professionals who are ready to take up leadership, leadership positions in multiple industries. The PGPM class of 2022 has participants from diverse backgrounds, all of whom have a high degree of functional and domain expertise. This batch has 114 participants with an average age of 29 years and average work experience of 6.5 years. We come from 15 different industries and varied educational backgrounds. This inherent diversity brings rich opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning and that are critical in the development of skills needed to work in a cross-functional area. This year, Samavesh has four conclaves, Information Management and Business Analytics, Finance, Operations and Supply Chain, and Marketing Conclave. The Marketing Conclave will begin later this evening, while the Operations and Finance Conclave have, in, have already concluded yesterday. The topic for today's Information Management and Business Analytics Conclave is Next Gen Organizations Future Proofing with Technology. Technology is changing the nature of work and innovations are redefining the basis of competition in most of the industries. Organizations now want to be more agile and want to deliver superior customer experiences, all by utilizing new tech to cut costs, improve quality, and build value. A new operating model is being adopted, and it combines dit digital technologies and operations capabilities in an integrated way to enhance revenue, improve customer experience, and reduce cost. The combination of AI, IoT, and advanced analytics has been fueling the growth of not just technology companies, but rather the industry overall. There are new players also, like metaverse, sustainability, and quantum computing. The objective for organizations now is not to perfect the future, but rather to be ready for many different possible futures that can unfold and the sustainability challenge that comes along with this paradigm shift. Before we start the conclave, we would like to introduce the area head of information management and analytics department, Professor Shailaja Chha. She served the government of India as a civil servant for almost a decade in the Indian Ordinance Factory. She brings with her almost three decades of information technology, global consulting experience with firms such as Wipro Limited, Cognizant Technology Solutions, Infosys Limited. In her last assignment at LNT Infotech, Professor Jha was the technology leader and delivery head for the consumer goods, 
media and technology practices. Through her corporate experience, she has led and managed large, large teams and built sustainable business units, bringing solid corporate experience to her academic responsibilities. Her work experience spans across the area of consumer good industries, communications, information media and entertainment, high technology manufacturing, transport and logistics, defense and financial services industry segments. We now request Professor Jha, Area Head of Information Management and Analytics Department to set the context for today's I am Conclave. Dear guests, let me use this. Uh, dear guests, our students, and all the participants in the Samavish Conclave, let me first extend a warm welcome to you. And uh, over the next three to four hours, let us jointly discuss this topic of future-proofing organizations with information technology, digital technologies. So when we, uh, we've had previous Samaveshas, and in the previous Samaveshas, we've had topics such as artificial intelligence, industry 4.0. So those have been the topics of Samaveshas in the past. And so as a group of professors and students, when we were thinking, what should be a new topic? We said, hey, we've just been out of the COVID scenario. Why don't we talk about future-proofing organizations with uh, technology, especially digital technologies? Because as we are going along, we see that assimilation of technologies, given the pace of change of technologies, is itself becoming a big issue to be dealt with. So then some folks said, hey, information management and analytics department have chosen a nature topic for the Samavesh. Because future proofing is a lot about talent and is a lot about human capital. But uh, so just to set the context a little bit, we have all been through COVID. I mean, two years of COVID times, companies have gone through a huge exogenous shock. Any time in our past, if we found it difficult to imagine exogenous shocks, if we found it difficult to imagine, imagine a black swan event, now we won't ever, be dif won't ever find it difficult to imagine. We have a real life experience, right? And it's, it was a, a tough period, a period that meant that survival of many companies was at stake as well. Many companies came away probably stronger. Many small and medium enterprises actually fell by the wayside. Many of your favorite retailers may no longer be operating. At least I have seen that happen. So COVID taught us that, is, that there is no permanency. COVID also taught us that there could be huge supply chain challenges. Today you may find it difficult to remember, but remember the search and hunt for remdesivir. Remember how pharma companies struggle, were struggling with even getting basic API formulations to do the manufacturing. So we've been through those times as well. We've seen times of acute supply chain disruptions. And if that was not enough, we then step into a scenario where we have a gradually unfurling war. An aggressor nation can choose to attack another country, which we thought was a developed economy country. We thought these happen with developing economy countries, but no. And this continues for a while. Do you think it does not make an impact in our everyday world? It does. And then the constantly unfolding sustainability challenge, the climate change that is staring at all of us on our faces. So we said, yeah, probably future-proofing is a good topic to discuss, right? And COVID actually led to a lot of irreversible changes also in our lives, right? We see many of them playing out today. I mean, my generation was not very comfortable with digital commerce. We were not very, your generation is perhaps the younger people, but uh, we have adopted digital commerce. So digital commerce has today become a way of commerce. Another the work, for, work, the work equation, the way it has changed, the way the work working operating model is changing, we don't even know where it's going to end. So yes, we are talking of a future that is truly unknown, truly unfolding, and that, see, technology was always changing. And for many of the technologies, as we all know, technologies follow that sigmoid S curve of growth, right? And for many of the technologies, we were in that fast pace of adoption stage of that sigmoid curve. 
So change that technology and its adoption brings into the wake. We've all seen it. We were seeing it. Then COVID and the newer set of, uh, you know, incidents and events that are happening around us. So, I mean, certainly information technology, digital technologies could play a big role in future-proofing companies. And today in course of our day, when we have some of our industry participants, uh, we will try to understand answers to those questions. But I asked myself the same question and I said, hey, what does this future proofing really mean for us? And truly, I could not come to answers. Yeah, we have technologies, we have advanced analytics, we have now AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning probably going mainstream in pockets. We have probably blockchain going mainstream in pockets, not everywhere, because it may not be a good use case for application everywhere. Suddenly, you have metaverse getting announced, and then you say, oh, yeah, metaverse is going to make a difference in some places. Will meta be the most powerful player in the metaverse universe, or will it be someone else? We don't know, right? And then there's a whole promise of quantum computing out there. So then, certainly, technologies will come, technologies will go, there will be different sigmoid curves. There will be a good blending of all of them going mainstream somewhere in the future. So what then should be things by which we guide ourselves? And I don't have a lot to say there, except uh, essentially we have seen that the companies that do manage to navigate the tumultuous times are the companies that were extremely, extremely customer focused, right? Their external customer, certainly, and the internal customers, their stakeholders, their vendors, their own internal employees. So essentially, having like a very sharp focus on your customer will be probably extremely, extremely important, right? So, and please understand, this customer journey has to be superlative. And this customer journey has now increasingly, this customer experience has to be increasingly digital. So that's one, one truth that I seem to understand that will probably stand us in good stead in every scenario. Then the other one has been that there has been an acceleration of digital transformation. And yes, COVID saw an acceleration of digital transformation. Now what is very important for us is to understand how we get the most out of technology investments and how we make a progress. How we get the most of technology investments and processes we need to take stock of our digital technologies and the results they've got us. And how do we take that needle? How do we move that needle forward? Third, and most importantly, whether we like to accept it or not, there has been a changing nature of work. This virtual workforce community that was enabled through video conferencing, workflow systems, actually has turned out to be more productive in pockets. The newer set of employees uh, value flexibility much more than probably my generation did. So what is that future of work? And what is, I mean, organizations will have to define their remote and hybrid operating models. And they will have to figure out a way to embrace the same. Because I think the work, work models are certainly undergoing a change. So COVID led to a bunch of irreversible changes. Work models is certainly one of them. And companies that do not, are not able to assimilate it fully will uh, be at the receiving end of not having got enough talent, good talent. So what does it mean for universities and colleges like us? What does it, uh, our students come to us for a two-year MBA or a one-year MBA program? That's about the only time we touch them and sort of try to make a difference in their lives, right? And we also accept that these are not the most formative years of your life. We are not your primary school teachers where we could have made a bigger impact on you. So what do we do with you, my students, our students? Uh, certainly embrace the enterprises in which you will go out to work. Embrace the fact that sustainability issues are going to be very critical issues in your workplace. The only thing that matters in the workplace perhaps is that hybrid working model. To me, the most important thing that matters to all of us as enterprises and as students and as future uh, our ma managers and professionals is the only thing that matters is agility and resilience. The only uh, organizations that will survive are extremely customer focused, stakeholder focused, which could also be your community, your society, resources. 
how agile are you how much are you how adaptive are you how fast can you embrace those changes in these changing times and in the context of so many different technologies un, uh, you know unfolding themselves playing out the way they are playing out perhaps that's the only thing that we can stand to learn learnability fast change so with that i'll stop uh, this address and i hope all of you have a nice next 3 hours as we you know unpeel this whole context of uh, future proofing organizations thank you adopting digital technology while being customer centric and being agile will definitely be the key to being a next gen organization thank you ma'am for such in insightful thoughts it is with great pleasure and honor that i welcome mr ramesh lakshmi narayanan as the keynote speaker for the information management and Bu business analytics conclave he is the chief information officer at hdfc bank he joined hdfc from presil where he spent 3 years as chief technology and information officer in this role he was responsible for transformation of presil's businesses by leveraging technology data and analytics he joined presil after a big data and analytics startup pragmatic service private limited that he co-founded and was acquired by presil in 2017 an industry veteran with over 25 years of experience mr lakshmi narayanan has held leadership position with organizations such as citibank abn amro bank and kotak mahindra group outside of work mr ramesh is an avid follower of cricket and also listens to indian music indian film music please join me in welcoming mr ramesh lakshmi narayanan on the stage different actually I, i i don't come to this campus uh, to kind of do conferences and kind of samavesh kind of events because i actually teach in the in the classrooms i think many of you probably this batch may not know but i besides whatever introduction that i got i think the key introduction got missed out that actually uh, i i spent almost now 15 years uh, teaching an elective here uh, to pgdm and pgpm uh, you know courses i've been here from 2007 and I was telling professor anil that the first time that i have actually not been to the campus actually in last 15 years of course take the covid out because that was more virtual so it's so nice to be back here in a different way uh, clearly you know uh, i think this is a much better way to interact i mean we've kind of gone through the three year uh, you know uh, grill um, that you know that none of us wanted to right so i think but i think in that sense uh, definitely there's a lot of change and lot of focus that's that's coming through in a very different uh, uh, manner so in some way some of these disruptions are great because they also tend to make you internally uh, introspect and and kind of realign right and that's what the theme today is how do we future proof so what i'm going to kind of look at the context and i'm going to talk through is is from a financial services industry because uh, that's the industry that i represent and that's the industry that i kind of in a way uh been uh, been part of for last 25 years of course the interesting part is that i've also done the technology part so it's a combination of the financial services industry and the technology experiences that i'm going to kind of talk through so it's a it's a very uh, interesting point because if you if you look at future proofing for financial services in india uh, and it's, this is a this is a known thing in 2007 i used to actually put up a slide in the class which used to show 40% banking penetration you know and and 60% used to be the mobile penetration just to kind of give you the numbers that and and we used to wonder and i used to actually say why would somebody have a mobile phone and not have a bank account okay it's it's intuitive right i mean it's you would first be financially secure then you start doing communicating i'm talking about 15 years back today it's unthinkable today you know you, when you are born you need a mobile right so fundamentally things have changed but the financial services industry you know was always in that sense it's it's a it's a good story if any of you have been following i'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, some of the the big bull and and some of the new series but it traces back to 1992 uh, and a lot of you would see would have would have read about the stories of uh, the the banking industry being one of the most non digital industries and i'm going to start from there because it's important to understand the concept and then i'll talk about what the future proofing of the financial industry is happening what's happening from a from a go forward perspective so like a lot of you would remember that you know indian banking was extremely manual 
I mean, uh, many of you would know, uh, and if you go back to your grandfather, they would tell you, even today they use checks, right? A lot of them today, even today, they don't, they don't use a G pay, they don't, they, they don't use a phone pay, but they would rather kind of deposit a check. Why is it that? Because they've been kind of bought up in that environment. Banking was a half a day activity. They would actually figure out a, a time to go to bank. Uh, and, and, and it stays. By the way, even today, when I talk to, just to give you a little kind of a simple example, when I talk to uh, our Ville Parle branch, uh, uh, branch manager last, last week, and she said, 70% of my customers are senior citizens today. They just come because they, that's, that's what they've been bought up with. So that was the generation that we saw in, in, in 90s. Obviously, uh, you know, the scam of 92 kind of changed a lot of things and, and it's very seminal because there's a, there's a very interesting committee uh, that was formed called Narsiman Committee. If any of you go back and you will see that. It was a very, very interesting part which said it, we, need digi we need systemization of banking industry. They actually said we need, need to put systems. Otherwise, banks used to run ledgers actually. So you will go to every bank, everybody would write their ledgers, huge registers, your accounts will be manually kind of calculated. The only exception are the foreign banks, and they were like the creamy layer, okay? So you can't bank with foreign, uh, foreign banks. They would ask for a minimum deposit of a lakh of rupees, and that's like impossible. And, and why is it important? Why am I bringing this point? Because at that point of time, the Indian banking industry saw very differently. In fact, that's the first time privatization happened. And you had a very interesting concept of, of you know, today what you see, the two seminal banks in India, ICIC and HDFC. They were the first ones to adopt technology as a driver. And the first core banking implementation was done in India in 1995. And it's very important to bring this point. It's not something India did not buy a core banking from outside. A lot of you may not know this. We never bought, went and bought a Temenos or a, or a Fiserv or any of the platforms. India actually decided to build. And why is it important? Because at that point of time, to make a core bank in India, you needed a mainframe computer. And mainframe compute was very expensive. You could not have afforded it. So what did we do differently? And it's a very learning lesson. In India, two organizations, which is an organization called CITIL and, a, and an organization that not, not, doesn't exist now, it basically has been bought over by Oracle, and an organization called Infosys. They actually decided to build Unix-based banking platforms. That was the first wave of digital. And why this was important? We never learned, you know, you would have seen a, a cycle of IT services industry. A lot of you would have worked with you know, I'm sure TCS, Infosys, and, and so on and so forth. But a lot of them were services-driven work. The first wave of the work in India happened through services. But banking was a very different, banking was the first place where actually IT built products. So two core banking systems came, a lot of you would know, uh, which is Finical and, and FlexCube. And they became the role model. In fact, over a period of 20 years, they became the global leaders in the product. So obviously, with rapid strides in technology, core banking happened, then net banking happened, mobile banking happened, like ATMs were all over the place, POS machines came. So we saw a lot of shift in the banking industry from a manual to a digital process. And I think the story was very good till about 2014. And why am I saying this uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a very thing? Till 2014, banks thought they had, so we started with a disadvantage, we, digit, we made systems quite fast, and since we adopted systems very fast, till about 2010, we reached a stage where banks thought they'd got a hold of their technology. What was happening in the, in the environment was very different. The banks were still, uh, they were kind of so closeted with their technology because most of them had built core banking on, on databases, uh, on, on Java programming and stuff like that, right? Three-tier architecture and st stuff like that. But suddenly, 2010 to 2014, there was a silent revolution happening on the other side, which is basically what the big tech firms bought. Right? They started bringing very different kind of cloudification platforms. Cloud was a concept which was, which was kind of little bit kind of budding, but it also bought a lot of innovation. So suddenly, relational databases went out. People started looking at NoSQLs. Suddenly, the languaging kind of changed. I mean, you, you had big data and Hadoop and all of that started coming in, right? And there was an external ecosystem that was changing, and the banks were continuing to work on the classical platform. And this is a great, like when you say future proofing, it's a great lesson of how, you know, sometimes you have to be on, constantly on your feet. You can't be kind of thinking that I'm now there. 
which is what happened with the Indian, I, I'm not kind of generalizing, I'm only talking about Indian private sector banking. A lot of us kind of got into the state of saying we've got good systems, customers can come on internet banking, they can use our mobile, uh, you know, our core bankings work well, we are able to lend very well, and it was a good growth. So, but then suddenly, you know, the other people were started building technologies on the peripheral, which were very different in nature. And then in India, 2015, 14, 15, you would have kind of heard about the first, uh, you know, the first offshoots of a different thought process came from the Jandhan scheme. I'm sure a lot of you would have heard about the Jam scheme, right? So why was it important? Because the 40 percent number that I spoke about 2007 had only moved to 52 percent by 2014, 15. And the mobile penetration moved from 60 to 95 percent. In fact, it, got, it had almost gone beyond 100 percent today. But in 2015, the gap had widened between a person who's having a mobile and having a bank account. And I think in some way, the government realized here that that's not the way. In fact, initially, if you remember, a lot of skeptic, skepticism on Jandhan accounts. Why are we opening zero balance accounts and stuff like that? But you would have seen a rapid scale out. I mean, between 2014 and 17, the penetration moved from 52% to 76, 77%. That's the kind of movement that it gave. And then came the game changer, and a lot of you know about what I call as UPI, right? I mean, I'm sure each one of you today understand UPI, but when it came, nobody thought it's going to come and change the game. I mean, today, looking back, we can talk about UPI with a lot of pride. But when it came, you will be shocked that the, U the banks were the first ones which did not want to U adopt UPI. And why is it that? Because there was zero MDR. Anybody knows what's an MDR? Merchant discount rate, right? So banks were always thriving on the fact that you can make interchange money between the merchant. So you can actually take, a, take some money from the merchant and facilitate that transaction, right? It was a source of income. And here is a channel which comes in, it says zero MDR. And banks said, oh, why should we invest into that? But they did not read the final print because the UPI had a very interesting final print. It, says, it said, you don't need to be a bank to be in front of a customer. You can be a payment service provider. If any of you have gone and read this, it's a very interesting concept called payment service provider. What is PSP today? Everybody knows what's a PSP, GPay, PhonePay, uh, Paytm, everything. And they're not banks. They were never banks. So what happened? The banks thought they had done everything. And they're sitting in a very good market where master visa are giving them a good interchange rate. Cards are, 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 are doing well. Debit cards are, are credit, both are doing well. What is the need? And they did not look at UPI. And what, did, what, what happened? Most of the PSP players used cloud in a very different manner. They had that native advantage of using a cloud platform. And what happened? The front-end customer experience shifted from the banks to these players. And it's a very, very, it's a simple argument, nothing, you know, but the fine print was missed out. The banks thought, we are the clearing guys, how can, how can a penetration happen without us? But suddenly you found a plethora of PSP players who can, you know, within days develop a, an app, uh, hook onto the UPI system and bank, and, and nobody realized it. And then of course the demonetization happened. It just took the digital transactions further. And then, of course, as luck would have it, COVID happened. So today, where are we? Right? We are $23.5 billion, tran uh, billion transactions per annum. China is $14 billion. Right? So in, in five years, you have caught up more than 350% of the growth of this market. This is what would actually call the actual future proving. So if you go back and roll back, should the banks have done differently, something differently? The answer is yes. And that's where the future proofing came in, right? Banks that got caught. And today when I'm going to talk about what is, so this obviously now banks are trying to catch up. You know, a, every single bank today wants to have its own app in the front end. Uh, they want to kind of digitally acquire customers uh, and all of this stuff, right? All of the future technology, that's usage of cloud platforms, usage of distributed databases, us, usage of, you know, uh, new age uh, 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 front end platforms. All of that is happening now, but it's a catch up game. Right? So it's a catch-up game. What is going to happen in the future? You know, while this, this catch-up happens, and wh what I see is that obviously there'll be balancing. I see a few banks uh, catching up because they have to catch up because they have the scale and the size. 
I also find a lot of fintechs actually getting the scale of the banks actually, and you will see a kind of a, a amalgamation that will come through. But standing today, if you to read a future proofing as to where we are going from, that's, a, that's the most important part of, of this talk in that sense that you've seen a, a set of series of waves that have happened. And you are today one of the most innovative digital plat uh, uh, financial services uh, economy in the world today. I mean, I can tell you that uh, with, with a lot of pride, you go to any country today, you open up a UPI app and show people what you have done. It's, it's phenomenal. Uh, you know, today, even today, if any of you go to the US, you cannot do a scan code transaction. You can't apply for an IPO on mobile, right? You, you can't uh, get a vaccination certificate on your mobile. A lot of these things are not there. So I think as a country, we have leapfrogged. But what I'm going to talk about is the digital 360 platform that's kind of panning out as we look at the future and how banks have to kind of get used to this. And what is this digital 360? It's a very interesting concept. I think before the UPI revolution, there was another revolution that came in India called Aadhaar. Right? A lot of you would have known about it today you know, a huge success story, 130 billion people having, you know, 1.3 billion people having a Aadhaar is, is, a, is a given. Every single Indian has an Aadhaar. It started as an identification program. I'm sure a lot of you know that it's being used very extensively in authentication and, and direct benefit transfers. This has been one of the most successful uh, schemes of the, of the current government. The fact that you could cut out a, a, a huge amount of middlemen and you could put the money directly into the, into the customer's account. That was the that was the Aadhaar of, of of earlier era, right? Identification, and basically, you know, government facility uh, subsidy benef benefit digitization of the benefit program. Where is that going now? So one of the corners of the digital 360 is Aadhaar. What is Aadhaar next happening? Just to give you a little uh, peek. About six months back, there's an experiment that was done in Jharkhand. That you you basically get in front of a camera. And the camera reads your face, and it matches your Adha photograph, and tells you it, it is you who are. Anybody wants to take a guess? What was the accuracy rate on this? Sorry? It was 90, 97 and a half, round about of 98% accuracy. What was so different? Because you had deep machine learning now running behind the scenes. What does it do? It, it changes the game. Why it changes the game for financial industry? Know your customer. I do not need to do an Aadhaar OTP. I don't need to have a one passport ID, this. In two years down the line, you could stand in front of a camera. You read the QR code of the Aadhaar. You match the photograph and bang on, right? So what's it going to do? It's going to quickly allow the digital adoptions. Anybody, you know, you can actually, within minutes, you can open an account. Not even today, while we, we do open an account, but there's still, in, in minutes, we, we, we do open accounts in three, four, five minutes, but we have to stand in, stand in front of a video camera. If any of you have done a, a video KYC, right? It still has to authenticate you. But this is going to change the game. And then a lot of other games, like identity theft, thefts will completely, you know, a, a lot of push will happen if you can get other facial recognition. So that's one of the pillars. The second pillar is obviously UPI. Where is UPI going? A lot of things done, apps developed, payment systems done. But where is the UPI 3.0 going? Today, UPI 3.0 is, uh, just to give, give you a background, the next wave is all ATMs will start accepting UPI. In fact, in the next few months, you don't have to carry your card inside an ATM. Right? You could just walk in into ATM, and, and, and you could identify yourself on a, uh, you know, on a UPI app, and you can withdraw money. Why do you need to even carry a, a, a plastic? Then there is a very interesting concept, e-rupee. Any of you have heard about e-rupee? It was launched as a pilot project during vaccination. I don't know if any of you followed this. So it's a simple technique where what was happening in UPI, merchant was accepting, right? And you were scanning the QR code. Imagine the reverse, that you have a benefit, and the merchant scans your mobile app. So what, why, why is this important? Where is, the, where is the directional movement here? The directional movement is in the direct benefit transfer. You cannot lock in to the end use of the product. What do I mean by that? If you give a, a fertilizer subsidy today, that fertilizer subsidy of 2,000 can sit into a, into a savings account of, of a particular beneficiary 
but he can cash it out and, and probably go to a, a liquor shop next door and, and use it. What does e rupee do? It will allow only the scan code will come for 2000 rupees. He has to go to that particular you know, urea shop and only after he scans the code and, and kind of gets the, the goods that the money is paid out. So this e rupee is like a kind of a quasi digital money. I'm not going into CBDC. I'll talk about it separately. A lot of you have these questions on blockchain digital. I'll come to that. I'm still in the classical world. So this UPI 2.0 is clearly a game changer from it from being having cardless ATMs to getting into, into mer merchant based, util utility based payouts. And then of course the game changer that ca came three days back, cards on UPI. The complete credit card platform is on you. Today you can't use credit cards on UPI. You would have seen that. You still have to kind of spy the plastic. But what, what is happening is in the next six months you will see the entire credit card platform coming onto the UPI. So that's the second corner of the digital 360. So all forms of payments getting deeper into the, into the pockets in a digitized way and then literally cutting out the plastic. That's what they are going. The third part, which is an interesting part, is, is two, two initiatives. I don't know if any of you have heard about called OKEN and, uh, and Account Aggregator. Uh, very interesting. If anybody has heard about OKEN? OK, it's called o And it's for a lot of you guys who are onto the operations and supply chain. It's a fundamental uh, pillar on which the supply chain will be disrupted. Why, why, what, what does it mean? It's called Open Credit Enabled Network. What does it do? It allows a working capital or a supply chain financing at the grassroots to happen digitally using digital credit. You don't need to go to a, if you're a merchant, a small merchant uh, or a small trader, small SME who wants a credit, today it's very difficult in the sense that there are a lot of documentation that goes behind it. But the way the open credit enabled network works is that I can apply to any particular bank and that bank can fetch the credit data from any other bank on the go, actually. Okay. It's a fundamental shift. Okay. It's a very subtle shift, but it's very important because today banks are closed today. So if, if HDFC Bank has done a credit assessment on an SME, they do not share that credit assessment with somebody else. But that's changing with this OKEN network. In fact, it's one of the pet projects of Nandan. Uh, he's spoken about it very interestingly through the iSpirit organization, if you go and follow that. And then on top of it, they have built something called account aggregate. What is account aggregator? Statements are closed loop. Today, every state time you have to download, a you have to get a credit, you have to download a statement of, an of another bank and you have to submit that statement to another bank from which you are taking the credit and that statement has to be reread because there's a lot of transactional data on the statement which you cannot read. Now, account aggregators facilitate. They sit in the middle and they allow. So assume if I'm a small merchant, I need a credit. I already have an operating account with, let's say, with, with Kotak. And let's say I go to ICICI to take a credit. I can ask my statement from Kotak to be given to ICICI online and analyzed and kind of scored. So fundamentally, what's happening with account aggregator and OKEN network is you're democratizing credit, actually. And it's very important for the supply chain. Because one is the banking data. And what's also happening in supply chain is very interesting. You're also getting data from the ERP hooked on. So as an example, if, if, if you have a distributor of Hindustan Lever, why can't I get your data of your, of your inventory? Right? And if I can match up your inventory data and your, or, and your throughput data from your shop with your bank financial statement online, the game changes. That, so that's the third part, the democratizing credit through uh, account aggregator, OKEN, and supply chain uh, digitization is the third pillar on which the digital uh, 360 is built. The fourth part is very interesting. How many of you have DigiLocker here? Very good. So that's good to see. So that's the fourth pillar. And what is DigiLocker doing? DigiLocker will, right now it's more kind of collecting your data. Like all of you would have done your mark sheets, your university score uh, uh, certificates, uh, your you know, government certificates. But what is the plan here? The plan is, is to open up DigiLocker through an API programming on a consent-based architecture. OK? For any work that, and this is not just financial services. This will happen across. It will happen in health. It will happen in, 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 in manufacturing, a lot of other places. 
you will see, you, you will be able to allow a third party authority to access your data on demand from DigiLocker. So what does it do? It again reinforces the know your customer policy far better, right? You can further kind of go and ratify your who you are. So that's the, that's the fourth pillar. The DigiLocker is the fourth uh, pillar. And the last piece is something called, an, uh, you know, I'm sure you would have heard, heard about called ONDC. I don't know if you have, any of you is follow, following uh, what government is doing on ONDC. Anyone wants to take a shot here? Again, for supply chain, guys, operation supply chain. No, it's the government's way of putting an Amazon marketplace. Right? Please go and follow. This is going to be a big game changer. A lot of push happening here. Okay, what is it saying? Any Kirana wala, any shopkeeper, anybody who wants to go digital, you will give, get a free space from government. Only the logistics have to be managed, and that is be part of your your you know inbuilt pricing actually. So that's the fifth pillar. So these are these are the kind of 360 that the government is thinking today, and not just government, the entire financial ecosystem is thinking. And that's where the future proofing of the banks have to go to. The banks have to start thinking, not just banks, fintechs, players who are, who are kind of connected to the banks, to use this, this digital 360 very effectively as things go along. And what is the kind of solutions? I mean, like as I said, it's not just, and now comes a pillar. So obviously, there's a lot of transformation thought that has to happen. First of all, banks have to move from an archaic legacy architecture to a modern cloud-based cloud architecture because a lot of work needs compute data, needs an ability to analyze, scale. I mean, just imagine UPI today is about 20, about you do about 20, 23 billion transactions uh, you know, annually today. And you're doing about 2 billion transactions monthly. And that's the kind of scale at which you cannot operate on on-premises. You have to go to cloud. right? So fundamentally, cloud will be one of the, the second big player is the data. What is happening in the data? Like a lot of you would know, we are moving from classical on-prem data warehouses to cloud-enabled, uh, you know, clearly modern, gener modern generation uh, lakes, actually. A lot of work is happening there. In fact, uh, that's just a part of it. What is also happening, a lot of APification of the, of the AIML is happening. What do I mean by APification of uh, AIML? Every data that you create on the lake, you have an ability to refine that data point and make it available as an API so that you can consume. As an example, today in your digital journey, just imagine if I'm able to keep plugging in the AIML models at every single hook, I can that much do better cross-selling, right? For example, as a simple example, I can actually get the credit rating of the guy on the first screen after five data points, rather than actually knowing after six screen that what, what, is, what his credit worthiness. And you could cut out a journey or, or make an offer or a credit offer much, much customized, much earlier, actually. So I think this whole data concept is very critical. Moving from classical uh, architecture to cloud is the second part. The third is just the, the, the journey, the way the digital journeys are created. The bank journeys are very poor today. If you look at the bank mobiles, uh, you know, they suck, actually, to be very honest. Uh, they're not very modern in their thought process. But you go and look at fintech uh, uh, mobiles. They're very interesting. They make the journey interesting. So there are a lot of challenges on the UI, UX, and customer experience engineering that will happen. That's the third fundamental shift that banks have to do as they get future proof. They have to stop looking you know, like a bank, actually. They have to start looking like you know, a fintech in that sense, no? just the look and feel. The fourth piece is harnessing new set of technologies, which is like blockchain, uh, you know, cryptocurrency, and things like that. What's happening there on Web 3.0? I think it's still a little bit of a mix and match, right? It is not a one-zero situation. A lot of us have come through a hype cycle. Today, everybody talks about Web 3.0, you know, bit blockchains and Bitcoins being there. The reality is the use case has to catch up. And what we are seeing is we're really seeing some of the use cases. And I'll, I'll have other speak, uh, you know, panelists talk about it. A lot of interesting use cases are being, being built in banking industry using blockchain. Platforms. Fundamentally, areas like trade. Very, why is it important? Two banks in two different geographies, supplier, you know, and and the buyer do not know each other, right? How do we put it all together? Imagine a technology like blockchain just simplifies because you know everybody on the ledger, right? You know, I mean, on the, on the block, you know everybody on the block. 
So things like that will evolve. So I think that's, that's the fourth part of the technology. So if you have to come back, harnessing data, moving to cloud, apification of the, of the uh, data, using of blockchain, uh, and then of course just the digitization, the user experience. So those are the areas where I think the future proofing of the banks has to happen. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an evolving science. And of course, after that, we will see where meta and, and things like that. Today, just having a, you know, a site on, on, uh, on one of these sandboxes is not a great, uh, it doesn't help you. I think metaverse will come in when the experiences on the banking will change. I mean, I, I do see, for example, virtual reality playing a very important role. Maybe you could walk into a branch and you could feel a, a different experience and talk to a, a, an agent on a virtual basis, right? Those things will happen. But I think they're still, I think they're right now in the, in the, in the early journey of the hype cycle. So some of those technologies we will see little bit coming. For me, the most practical thing is to look at the first three, four, which is cloud, data, AI, ML, uh, you know, and, and some part of the blockchain that's coming through. And, that, and then the other part, which I want to kind of very uh, clearly focus, a lot of us got a little bit more enamored by the urban phenomenon. Oh, I have digital credit card, I need my limits to be split. I want party funds to be split. See, all of this is urban phenomena. The real digitization will happen in the rural areas. I mean, can I, for example, really get, get to the level of financing a farmer or financing uh, an agriculture equipment digitally or building a low cost housing, right? I think that's where the India or the Bharat of, uh, of next 10 years would go. And banks will play a very, very critical role there. So clearly I see that journey of digitization, which means the ex coming back to customer experience, more vernacular or, or local language based journeys, assisted journeys. Like I think a lot of hype has been created on unassisted journey. I mean, we are very urban savvy. savvy. We go and scan an app and then we are down. Everything can be done online. But a lot of people down there need help. And the help has to be like subtle. It cannot be in the face kind of a help. So I think the assisted journeys will, with, with local languages will evolve. So if you see, a lot of the digital 360 things that the government is talking, a lot of modernization of the banking platform that I spoke about using the new age technology, and then the, the use of that into relevant kind of use cases. That is the future proofing that I see uh, banks like us or any other bank, uh, large banks that, that wish to transform uh, go through this journey. So it's a very exciting time. I think uh, and as, as kind of students out here of PG, uh, PGPM, who come from IT industry or from, from uh, manufacturing finance, the key is to kind of soak up this, this whole thought process of how the financial uh, you know, system is, is playing out and really kind of work on, on, on enhancing the knowledge on the use cases. Right? Clearly, that's where you're going. Some part of IM students largely focusing the tech side, uh, operations and, uh, and supply chain, largely looking at use cases. I, I've not spoken about IIT, IoT because financial industry is still not very, very uh, uh, out there. And I'm sure some of the other examples in manufacturing would be far better. Uh, and then the marketing guys, really the digital marketing space, you know, usage of AIML, journey, customer experience, all of that stuff would come through. And finance by itself is also changing, right? A lot of stuff around how do we evaluate uh, projects using digital uh, uh, platforms? I think, so there is, there is something in it for each one of you as you look at this 360 of the digital that I spoke about. And how do you kind of, if, if you guys are interested in a financial tech or a related financial uh, 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 services career, this would be a very interesting uh, place to look for. So uh, with that, I will kind of uh, stop my, my session and I just, and hope that it give you a good peek into where we are going from a future proofing. Uh, and I, I'm not covering a lot of the internal stuff that, uh, that was spoken in the earlier session from our own employees going through cultural. Those are given things today. I mean, banks today are very laid back. Uh, it's difficult you know, to have a six day week. Uh, people want a five day week. People want to work from anywhere. Uh, you know, hybrid working culture, all of that is, is evolving. Uh, and I, I don't want to kind of talk about it, but that will, that's a natural fallout across all the industry. I think things will settle. But from a financial services point, India is a very exciting place. I think financial services and the digitization would lead the next generation and next 10 years. And I think it will be the lever on which our, our movement from, you know, I would say a almost develop, developed economy to a fully developed economy will hinge upon. So I think great exciting times for the Bharat. And, uh, and I, I really want, I'm, I'm, I'm sure each one of you would want to leverage that opportunity that's coming in your way. 
thank you and, and, and have a great career. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lakshmi Narayanan, for guiding us about how the fintech industry works, about the five pillars, the 360-degree approach. And I'm sure many of us would get into fintech uh, financial industry, and then we'll make the changes that you are suggesting. And yes, we apologize for not recognizing your efforts over the year. And thank you so much for guiding my batch. You will be guiding my batch and my previous batches towards success in the industry. Moving forward. I'd, I'd now like to invite Swarna Vimprala and Aditya Arora, participants of the PGPM class of 2022, to take us on a journey of how next-gen organizations will future-proof with the help of technology. Swarna has 5.5 years of experience in IT sector at Accenture Technology. She worked in the capacity of a functional consultant in healthcare and automotive domains. Aditya comes with an experience of 5.5 years working with Wipro. For the first three years, he worked as an SAP functional consultant and then worked as a consultant in enterprise application space. Please welcome them with a big round of applause. Thank you, Unkar. Hello, everyone. I'm Swarna Vimprala. And I'm Aditya Roda. We are here from PGPM Batch 2022 to discuss upon the relevance adoption and challenges of our next-gen technology to future-proof our organization. Before we delve into this topic, let us try to understand why do we really need future-proofing. Over the past couple of years, we have seen multiple disruptions, whether it was COVID pandemic, Ukraine war, or the semiconductor shortage. It is clearly evident that the organizations are not well prepared and how their existing long-term strategy has gone for a toss. If there is anything that we can see over the past two years, it has been that the future is unpredictable. We have also been used to the idea that a disruption is temporary and the usual way of working gets restored pretty soon. But this disruption has brought about some changes that are not so temporary. Whether the employees are not, unwilling, are not willing to come back to office or the consumers have con uh, grown extremely used to the idea of online shopping from the comfort of their homes. With the business now going online, security has become a critical issue. This quick pivoting to online has also given the organization an extremely small window to redo their entire strategy before they are thrown out the window by their competitors. There are numerous ways to address these concerns. Organizations can create dynamic business strategy, make their organization structure more robust, reimagine re their entire organization through technology, or move to a growth-based strategy, which is largely different and complemented by a consumer-centric approach. With the geographical lines blurring faster than ever, technology has started to be perceived as a panacea to all the problems and connectivity-aided tech growth has started to catch up industries that have always worked in conventional ways. Tech has now taken the center stage in helping organizations gain competitive advantage and navigate themselves through the uncharted territories. We have always seen many technological innovation happen in silos. Now, multiple technologies are coming together on which innovations are being carried out. IoT, AR, VR have come together to create solutions that have helped organization to improve three facets, increasing revenues, reducing costs, and optimizing asset efficiencies. There are multiple new players on the block. IoT and AI have started to be a thing of past and we have been hearing a lot about metaverse, quantum computing, and blockchain all with a hidden but evident baseline of sustainability. While all this sounds extremely jazzy and people have been gearing themselves up for the next-gen technologies, what needs to be seen is, are these technologies just a fad or they are here to sustain? We'll take you through a, what is currently happening in the industry and organization. When it comes to adopting to the new technologies, organizations can be classified into three broad category, categories. Innovators, these are the ones who grab the opportunities and are always in line to 
to grab the opportunity and scouting for the opportunities. A major furniture retailer saw a huge bump in their revenue when they adopted technology driven sales through AR VR and a video conferencing tool just became the buzzword and a home name during COVID times. The next are adopters. These are the ones who follow reactive based approach and are mostly late to the party. A major pharma company which was not excited to move to cloud from its on premise infrastructure but had to move to cloud due to the advantage of quantum computing and event based company event booking company changed its business model and offerings due to the covid the next are followers who are slow on the move and get the leftovers a industry hotel chain found it difficult to come back when industry saw an improvement signs during covid times moving on let's have a sneak peek at what these few industries could ponder upon to gain and maintain the hegemony telecom industry for seamless development of data heavy applications containing ar ai and streaming video storage devices and computational operations must not be far from the connected devices Organization can future proof and achieve competitive advantage by adopting 5G, integrating edge computing, IoT devices, and AR systems to cloud. 94% of the communication service providers anticipate that edge computing will have a favorable impact on operational responsiveness in the next five years, followed by lower operational expenses, automated workflows, faster decision making and reduce latency in the data processing. Next, we are concentrating on the pharma industry. Quantum computing is gaining momentum here as well. And as per the analysts, industries and their potential applications can be clustered on the basis of two factors, expected timing of quantum and the value of this advantage in their business. There are four categories being mentioned by them. Racing team members, riders, followers, and observers. The racing team members are the front, fr forefront of the immediate business benefits. They are experimenting currently on the quantum chemistry using AI, ML, and both. Followers see high potential and high developmental time frames of quantum advantage in research by disease understanding and hypothesis development, lead generation, dose optimization, development by patient identification and stratification, and designing new medicines by development of molecular formulations. Now we come to the financial sector. Though chatbots have been deployed by many companies, their usage has been fairly limited. There is, this is where natural processing language can come into the picture. NLP can provide chatbot with the context of message and identifying opportunities within the message. It can also be trained to identify emotional state of the user and if needed cater to them on priority. Also the overall process can be st streamlined with the help of analytics. Though many banks you are using blockchain in some shape or form, but the true potential has not been utilized. Blockchain high efficiency high energy consumption model puts a break on its acceleration and adoption. So industry can use other energy efficient blockchains such as consensus mechanism like proof of elapsed time. Quantum computing is still in its nascent stage and it can enable financial services to re-engineer operation processes such as treasury management, trading and asset management. Robotic process automations are the primary functions to generate report and automate repeatable tasks. But RPAs can also manage instant payments. RPAs allow bank to save money, cut on human error and improve processing speed. Now we'll move to the manufacturing sector. Hyper automation is a unique way to rapidly identify, wet and automate many businesses and IT processes. Can Though amalgamation of the various technology areas, hyper automation can enable scalability, remote operations and fixed business model disruptions. Though augmented reality is used in industry for now, but its usage is limited doors of entry. 
ऑगमेंटेड रियालिटी एंड वर्चुअल रियालिटी कैन इम्प्रूव लाइक प्रोडक्ट डिजाइन असेंबली एंड मेंटेनेंस एंड रिपेयर नाउ विल मूव टू द रोड ब्लॉक्स दो अडोप्टिंग अ डिजिटल स्ट्रैटेजी मैनी अ टाइम्स कैन हेल्प एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ग्रो बाय लीप्स एंड बाउंड इट माइट नॉट यील्ड बेनिफिट्स टू ऑल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन सेवेंटी परसेंट ऑफ द डिजिटल ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन फेल टू डिलीवर ऑप्टिमम रिजल्ट अराउंड हंड्रेड ईयर बैक देयर वॉज अ रेवोल्यूशनरी टेक्नोलॉजी दैट प्रूव डिसअपॉइंटेड डिसअपॉइंटिंग दैट वॉज इलेक्ट्रिसिटी some companies invested in dynamos and motors and yet expected to see a surge in productivity which did not come it took henry ford another 50 years to get to the true potential of the technology strategy business and technology have to come in coherence any deviation in one facet can have a threatening effect so how do organization decide the path to adopt tech This can be done by following this framework. Can the organization disrupt their primary area through next gen adoption? If not, they need to wait and decide resources to manage the tech evolution. If yes, has the value chain area been identified? If not, they need to follow the landscape when tech seems promising. If yes, they can monitor and scale their value chain or not. If that can be done, then reframe from the ra radical initiatives and finally if they are able to follow all of it then actively position organization and lead industry by disrupting the com competitive landscape with this recommendation we would like to end our presentation thank you thank you so much aditya and swarna for uh, explaining to us the role of technology in different industries the roadblocks that we face and the upcoming innovations that we need to do in order to do the work more seamlessly now we would like to break for a small high tea break let's gather back again at 11:30 sharp after a 20 minutes break see you then thank you welcome back everyone hope you had a good tea break i now request professor shelja jha our keynote speaker mr ramesh lakshmi narayanan Mr Ma all the panelists Mr Mandar Kulkarni Mr AR Vishwanathan Mr Prateek Singh Mr Vishal Shimankar and Mr Kunal Jain to please come up, come up, uh, come up on stage as we start with their introductions